can everyone hear me okay? So I'm a little short, so I'm gonna stand over here. I normally don't stand behind the podium. I like to walk around, but because I'm stuck here, because the podium is here and the microphone's here, so I stand over here. So to, again, thank you for inviting me to speak at this very important conference. Um, I thought about talking about this um, problem with central line infection, as it's not just a problem in the United States, but it's a problem throughout everywhere in the world. At our hospital, um, we were charged to decrease central line infection as one of the patient safety goal. And that a lot of times, if, um, if there is central line infection or if there's MRSA bacteremia, the insurance company will not pay for our care for the patient. So it's a really big incentive for us to try to decrease not just bacteremia, and particularly MRSA, but also central line infection. So before I begin, I wanted to discuss, um, there's different terminology that you might see in the literature. You might hear essential line associated bloodstream infection, or you might hear catheter related bloodstream infection. But in general, patients in the neonatal ICU, and a lot of this could be applied to pediatric ICU as well. Um, I'm discussing mostly in the neonate ICU just because that's my area of expertise. Most of our patients have central line um, that uh, particularly PIC lines, per, which stands for a perfectly inserted central catheter. And when you think about it, central venous catheter can lead to bloodstream infection, a thrombus, infusion, extravasation, phlebitis, and then distal edema. So CLAPC, central line associated bloodstream infection, are an important cause of increased morbidity, mortality, and also cost in our patients in the neonatal ICU. Studies have shown that the reported incidence of CLAPC in neonate ranges anywhere between 3.2 to 21.8 CLAPC per 1,000 central line days. So in the US, we use the CDC definition of central line um, uh, infections. I'm not sure what you guys use here in Vietnam, but I see that you guys use the same. So uh, bloodstream infection that occurs while a central venous catheter is in place up to 48 hour after central line removal. So by definition, a, a CLAP C is when you have a single positive blood culture for a recognized pathogen that's not related to an infection at a different site, or you're gonna have two or more positive cultures for common skin contamination, such as coagulase negative staph, which we know as cons, drawn at a separate occasion, plus clinical signs for infection such as fever, hypothermia, apnea, and bradycardia. So when you look at the epidemiology of CLAPSI in our neonatal population, you see that CLAPSI, like I said, it was one of the most common cause of late onset sepsis in hospitalized patients. The risk factor include prematurity, low birth weight, increased NICU length of stay prior to central line insertion and prolonged duration. And among this, premature infants are at most the highest risk, mainly due to their skin integrity. When you think about their skin, they're the patients that require the longest central line days. They require multiple um, medications, and then they're also requiring prolonged parental nutrition. And about the majority, about 80% of CLAPSI are due to gram-positive organism with coagulase negative staphylococcus aureus being the most dominant, which we all know is the most common. And that recent evidence suggests that reducing cons infection may also reduce cognitive disability in preterm infants. This is some recent findings that they find that if we can decrease cons, that there's some benefit in cognitive disability. So today, I know we have a very short time. I don't wanna go beyond our time. But I'm going to discuss about five different strategies that may or may not uh, reduce central line infection. And before we even begin with these strategies, keep in mind, um, I don't know what you have here in Vietnam, but maybe even if you don't have it, you may implement it. So we're going to first discuss about giving prophylactic antibiotic before line removal. That does not sound too great. Um, using antimicrobial impregnated central venous catheter antimicrobial dressing, central line bundles, and antibiotic lock therapy. So let's begin with prophylactic antibiotics before line removal. So we all know study have found that the peak occurrence of infection after you remove the central line 
usually occur within 72 hours, so three days. So some of the possible mechanism between central line removal and sepsis is one, when you remove the line, you know, the line has a biofilm that's formed on the catheter surface. It, when you remove the line, it may be stripped off where then you're gonna have an influx of bacteria into the bloodstream. Another theory is that the remover of the catheter may damage the vessel wall, which then leads to inflammation, infection that's caused by the bacteria in the biofilm. So studies have shown that possibly the use of antibiotics prophylactically giving one dose or two dose um, prior to removing the line can reduce the rate of CLAPSI in the NICU. However, studies have shown it to be controversial, which I'm gonna discuss with some of the studies. And we all know that we don't wanna use so much antibiotics because we know that when we use a lot of antibiotics, it also may increase the risk of selecting for antimicrobial resistant organism. It alters the gastrointestinal microbiome and also increase in healthcare costs. So as a pharmacist, we always un, um, realize that we are pretty much anti-antibiotics in the majority of our patients, but at the same time, we have to be pro-antibiotic when we're trying to save lives at the same time. So first, I wanna illustrate three studies that actually looked at prophylactic antibiotic and have shown to reduce of central line infections. These studies ranges anywhere between 2007 all the way to 2015. What I wanna focus here is there are different patient population that you see here, but bottom line, the patient's average is quite small with a mean gestation age of 27 weeks. When you look at the regimen of the antibiotics, you can see that two study looked at cefazolin and one study looking at vancomycin. So they all have different regimens between these studies. And among these three studies, they all found to um, have a significant reduction in sepsis. Every study have a different primary outcome. So some study looked at sepsis as their primary outcome. Some study looked at sepsis as in bloodstream infection, meaning you have a positive blood culture. And then some study looked at decrease in clinical sepsis, all that means is your culture is negative, but the patient's having symptoms or having abnormal biomarker. So keep that in mind that each study has a very different outcome, but regardless, they all seem to reduce, significantly reduce either the incidence of sepsis, bloodstream infection, or clinical sepsis. On the contrast, you know, as a pharmacist or when you're evaluating lit literature, one of the best talk I like to give is a pro and con debate. I think that as a, a pharmacist, we always think about pro and con. You cannot be on one way. So everything that you find that's good, you need to find that maybe it's not good. So these three studies found there is no reduction with a prophylactic antibiotic. And these are newer studies ranging anywhere between 2014 and actually not one done by a Vietnamese person, and I know this person in 2021. So you can see the study ranges anywhere between 850 patients all the way down to 104 patients. In these three studies, they did use all the same antibiotics, which is vancomycin, which makes sense, right? Because vancomycin is probably the only drugs that actually covers coagulase negative staph. I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention to you guys. Oh, this doesn't work. Sorry. Okay, it doesn't work. Anyway, all these studies use vancomycin. As you can see here, they use one dose and they give it before they remove the line. What they found here, again, their outcomes are a little different. Some are in sepsis, some are bloodstream infection, and some are sepsis evaluation. So the first study by Casper in 2014 found no significant difference in sepsis evaluation. What that means is just getting blood cultures and getting biomarkers. Um, they found no difference in culture negative sepsis, as well as bloodstream infection between the two groups, meaning no antibiotics and yes with antibiotics. The study by Baguera found no significant difference in the rate of clinical sepsis or bloodstream infection. And then the last one by Van 2021 also found no significant difference in the rate of clinical sepsis. So this study did not look at bloodstream infection, but more so clinical sepsis, again, which is defined by culture negative sepsis. Um, sorry, but my projector doesn't work. 
Okay, so why are these studies different, right? When you're evaluating literature, it's really important to identify why the studies are different. So one, there are different demographics. Some study had larger gestational age, why some other studies don't. When you look at the duration of the central line before they pulled it, they're all different. So the study by Tran who found no difference, those patient central line days was a mean of 37 days, meaning those patients had a longer central line in place compared to a study by Hay Hemos, which only have a very short period of time. So perhaps, if your patient has a, a prolonged duration of central line catheter, it may, work, may not work for those patients. There's also different antibiotic use, right? Four of the study used um, vancomycin and two study used cefazolin. We all know, including my institution, most cons are not susceptible to cefazolin. In that institution, more than 90% of their con is susceptible to cefazolin. They have different regimen. They also have a different time of administration of the prophylactic antibiotic before they pull the central line. They also have different outcomes, right? Our biggest outcome is bloodstream infraction. But again, maybe clinical sepsis is a very important outcome as well, because as we know, in the neonatology field, we treat a lot of antibiotics for culture negative sepsis. And then they evaluate different types of central line. Some patients have Pick, pick lines, some people have a broviac lines, which is in, in tunnel line, and some patients have umbilical venous catheter. Okay, so the next one I'm gonna discuss is, is how about the using of the in, uh, antibiotic impregnated central catheter, meaning the antibiotic is within the central line. So again, clinical trials have shown that antimicrobial impregnated central venous catheter has reduced central line infection in adults and children. And recently, a study found that um, there's a multi-center study, open label randomized control trial that is conducted in 18 neonatal ICU in England that actually looked at a pediatric patient. And they found that antimicrobial impregnated PIC lines coded ref refermycin with myconazole versus standard PIC line. So let's look at the results. So what they found, and this is in our neonatal population, so it's very disappointing. They found no significant difference in the incidence of bloodstream infection between regular central catheter versus those impregnated with antibiotics. They found no difference in rapamycin resistance. The uh, mortality, clinical outcomes, and line removal were also the same between both studies. They also found some resistance, which is not a great problem, and they also found that it was not cost effective. So again, we, a lot of time, we, we, despite the positive findings that they found in adults and in pediatric patients, unfortunately in this big NICU, they found that it was no difference in the neonatal population. So we also have um, antimicrobial dressing. So these are the dressing that the nurses use to apply when they uh, put the central line. So the uh, dressing is applied over the central venous catheter site have been proposed to reduce central line uh, bacteria infections. However, there are some concern that baby, especially very premature babies, their skin integrity is very thin. They absorb drugs uh, percutaneously like three to 10 times more than term babies, that there might be concern for local and systemic adverse effects from the uh, medication itself. So I'd like to review really quick three studies that looked at different dressing. So one compare chlorhexidine dressing with alcohol cleansing versus polyurethane with pyridine, uh, pyridine, pyridone, and then the other one looked at silver alginate versus control. So among these three studies, we have about 855 patients. And when I break between the two studies, the first two study that compare chlorhexidine with pyridine found no significant difference in the risk of central line infection and sepsis. However, they did find a significant reduction in the risk of catheter colonization in the patient that received chlorhexidine. And also patients in the, uh, the chlorhexidine alcohol group were again, more likely to develop contact dermatitis. With a study that looked at silver alginate versus the control, they found no significant difference using that as well. So at my institution, we do use um, a, 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 an um, a improvised chlorhexidine on our, our central line dressing. 
Next, I'd like to do uh, central line bundles. Is this something that in Vietnam, do people use this in their neonatal or any ICU? Um, um, so I think this is something that has been a, a big um, um, development in the United States that has really shown to decrease central line infection. So central line bundle originally developed by the Institute of Healthcare for improvement, mainly for adult patients with central line. And in 2012, a central line bundle was recommended by the CDC to decrease central line infections for both adult and pediatric patients, including our neonates. So the bundle is defined by a small, for, straightforward set of evidence-based practice that when you perform collectively and reliably have been shown to improve patient care. So when you implement the bundles, keep in mind that the bundles should include five components and three types meaning you have to use the bundle during when you place the line, when you maintain the line, and when you remove the line. And the five components is all the different strategies in hand hygiene, the bearer precautions, chlorhexidine skin antisepsis, catheter selection, and also every day you review the line. So I'd like to review, there's 24 studies that looked at a meta-analysis that was published in 2018. And among this 24 study, I found this study because it does include four low to medium income countries that may be applicable to Vietnam. So there's 12 in North America, six in Europe, two in Australia, and four in low to medium income countries. So 90 stu 19 study did before and after implementation. So more of like a QI project. Five study did observational. Keep in mind that none of these studies were uh, randomized controlled trials. The majority of this study, again, used the CDC definition for CLAP-C. So before they implemented central line bundles, the CLAP-C ranges between these um, 24 studies anywhere between 1.3 to 31.6 per 1,000 catheter days. So when you look at the, when they did the male analysis, they found that central line uh, bundles resulted in a significant reduction, a 60% reduction rate in CLAP-C as you can see here by the relative risk of 0 0.41. Also, CLAP-C decreased from 0 to 14.9. So you can imagine it went from 1.3 to 31 down to 0 to 14.9. So some institution, their rate of central line has been zero. However, in order to maximize the effects of the bundle, compliance is the biggest challenge. And among these studies, despite a very low compliance of about 30%, they still achieve a significant rate of decrease in central line infection. Also, when you look at these studies, most of the common technical and professional elements was that all the study used some sort of skin preparation. They had a maximum bearer precaution. They did daily assessment of the central line needs and they did a lot of extensive education and training. So things to consider before you implement central line bundles, right? You realize that the bundle components vary from studies to study, but regardless of what kind of elements in your bundles, all of the study found it to significantly reduce central line infection. You also realize that the antiseptic skin agents were different, but it doesn't matter. It still decreases central line infection. And all the studies stress on the importance of staff education. Some of the studies, however, most of them, unfortunately, did not look at compliance rate. And we know, and they uh, proved that the increased compliance can result in a greater reduction of CLAP-C. So if you can imagine if even 50% compliance or 70% compliance, how much of a significant impact you can see. They also found that in order for central line bundle to sustain, we all know we're busy working. We don't have all the technology, everyone's busy. This, this involves the, the physicians, the nurse and the pharmacist that a lot of time in order to sustain, you have to have daily surveillance, knowledge of both the medical and the nursing staff. You have to give them real feedback. So at our hospital, when we um, implement this, every month the nursing was sent out the incidence rate of our central line, and then give a thumbs up and, and give them positive feedback. And that's what really encourages everyone. And that you wanna share that data with the group. When our peaks go up, people need to know that as well. And most importantly, usually the bedside nurse really takes charge of any neonatal ICU I work. 
you need to get the buy in from the nurses. If your nurse are agreeing to do this, you're going to have a very successful program. So I want to share you um, an experience at our institution. So before we were going to implement um, prophylactic vancomycin because we did have a high rate of central line infection and our job was to decrease central line infection. So we did a retrospective study and our NICU is a 56 bed. It's not as big as a lot of NICU here. And we are in an academic medical centers. We, I included other patients with different central line that did, were not on antibiotic at the time of central line removal. We have about 149 encounters. We, we found that within our patient, our patient's uh, sepsis evaluation was only 5%, was very, very low. And only one patient was treated for culture negative sepsis. We did not have anyone with bloodstream infection. So that we, we also found no significant difference in the type of line. So because of that, we realized that we don't need prophylactic vancomycin before we remove the line in our patient. But keep in mind that when we were doing this study, um, that was over two years that our institution already started to implement central line bundles. So that can also affect your findings. So this is our uh, NICU central line um, infection from 2012 and 2022 at my hospital. So you can see by the blue line is the actual rate. And then the red line is just uh, a, an average. So when we first started central line bundles here, our, we had created a team. And again, it has to be multidisciplinary. So it includes the pharmacist, nurses takes charge, and a several physician champions to implement this. So we initiated um, AFIDS, which I'll tell you what that is. So our rate was pretty high. And for us, 7% was pretty high at our, our hospital. So after we uh, modified, our rate went down a little bit. We did more education to the medical staff and we have a closed line system. And what that is, is that we never have lock our, our essential line. The whole system is always closed so that you don't uh, um, get any bacteria into our patient. And every day the nurse changes all the IV at the same time and they have to gown up and wear gloves to change them. So we did that and the rate went down a little bit. And then we start implementing weekly reminder, checklist, daily, and then they start uh, adding the chlorhexidine bath. And that really decreases our incidence down to less than 4% at that time. Again, we are continually to do this as a quality improvement and keep on changing. And then by 2016, we created a specialized team where every time we remove the line, this is before COVID that we did not have to wear a mask, but now we have to wear a mask. So back then, um, anytime they remove the line, they have to wear gloves, gown, mask. And of course, all the parents, when they're holding their baby, we do a lot of kangaroo care. They also have to wear glove, gown, and mask. And then they, we don't culture from any line. All the blood culture has to be from a peripheral site. And that number also went down a little bit as well. And then we start adding monthly meeting, real-time feedback, encourage our staff to continue to wash their hands. And then we did Every week we did an x-ray because babies, the, the, you can move the line when you position the baby. And if the baby is the size of a 500 gram, you move the line, your tip of your pick line should be in your superior vena cava. And when you move it, it could move out and it could not be central anymore. So we check our lines every week to make sure. And we check our line after the nurse does a ch change of line. So our nurse changed the line every week and only a few nurses that are trained to change the line are um, trained to do that. And then we check the line. And because of that, we found that the rate of CLAPC has gone down to zero for many years. Then guess what happened? Our rates went down and then COVID happens, right? COVID hits us. We couldn't go to work. I was rounding from home and they only let one doctor in the NICU. The medical resident could not be in the NICU, only one doctor. We were all working remotely. So of course, limited staff, people forget, they don't wash their hands. And then our rate increases again. And until this day, our rate now is starting to decrease. And this is about a week ago. We are 320 day clap C free. So I think that Again, some of the strategy may or may not work, but if you have any sort of bundle, making sure that compliance is really good. And this is a completely nursing driven that is supported by a physician champion. 
So this is an example of our hospital-wide bundle that we use for all patients, all the ICU, adult, pediatric, and, and neonates. We call it AFIDS. So assess the line every day. We talk about, do we need the line? Why do we need the line? Because as soon as a baby's done, we remove the line right away. We promptly remove the line when there's no longer needed. H stands for hygiene, and these are the details of those lines. IV tubing changes. The nurse marks all the line exactly what day they change the tubing. Obviously, parental nutrition needs 24 hours. They mark down all the dressing changes and, and then how they scrub and clean the hub. So keep in mind that most of the time, this is, again, a nurse-driven, but a lot of time it involves the pharmacist and the physician, and we review the number every month to make sure that we're in compliance. And the nurse will walk around, and we have a folder at the bedside as well. The last thing I want to talk about is antibiotic lock therapy, and I'm not sure you guys do this in the United States, I mean, in, in Vietnam. So again, a lot of time people like to, you know, when you manage central line, we all know that if the patient has a central line infection, technically you should remove the line. But we know that's very difficult to remove the line in the neonatal ICU, very, very difficult. So a lot of time we try to treat the line as well. So we all know that when you have a positive culture, you're gonna try to give antibiotics through that line. And that obviously the antibiotics should target against that organism and that susceptibility and MIC. So I'm not really gonna talk about how to manage this, but a lot of times, um, you, what, what I wanna talk about is, again, this is all about prevention of central line infection. So we have used what we call it ALT, antibiotic lock therapy, has been used to prevent central line infection. And when you think about antibiotic lock therapy, it contains high concentration of antibiotics into the catheter lumen, hence reducing the colonization of bacteria. And then the antibiotic concentration is now when you give it, it's instilled, should be at least 100 to 1,000 times your MIC. So regarding what drugs do you want to lock, you want to make sure that the solution that pharmacy makes and dispense to the patient should be at least 100 to 1,000 times your MIC. And that many different antimicrobial has been used as an anti-lock anti therapy. So most commonly people use vancomycin, right? Because what's the most common infection with central line is coagulase negative staph. And studies have shown that anti uh, vancomycin lock therapy has significantly reduced CLAPSI and total antibiotic exposure. They also found no um, difference in the incidence of bloodstream infection and that the majority of the patient had gram positive with coagulase negative staph and that they also found the number of gram-positive bacteria was also significantly lower in the vanco lock group compared to the heparin group. Is that rain? Wow, I am in Hanoi. They found no uh, difference in the number of gram-negative when they use vancomycin lock, and they've also found no resistance of, of vancomycin-resistant enterococci or cephalococci. And they also um, measure in the blood to see if there's any detectable vancomycin because you don't want it to. You don't want to give it to the patient. You're only lacking the catheter and they did not find any detectable um, uh, concentration. When they compare the vancomycin with the uh, traditional heparin lock, they found that more infants in the heparin group develop hyperglycemia. You all, other studies by this study in 2022 looked at different uh, lock therapy to treat central line infection. As I alluded earlier, we don't, it's very difficult to remove the line. So we try to savage the line by locking our line. So this study looked at um, using different antibiotics. You can see here, they had four patients that they locked with meropenem, a drug that you guys love here, amikacin, vancomycin, and mycofungin. They locked different antibiotics. These are the patients that have these particular organism with susceptibility. So, and then they found that when you lock them, you have to dwell the time for six hours. And what that means is with the central line, the nurse will lock the line, instill the antibiotic, and let it sit as long as you can. And this is very difficult in the neonatal ICU because if you have patients on TPN or continuous infusion, you cannot stop those drugs, right? So a lot of times it becomes a very big challenge for these patients. Ideally, in the NICU, they can only lock for six hours, but in other patients, you can lock it for a longer period of time. They found that 84.6% of infants has resolution after the antibiotic lock therapy. 
two infants fail and both of them received amacacin and both of them had Klebsiella pneumoniae. Ethanol lock is something I like to introduce because we try to reduce an uh, vancomycin resistance, right? We try to reduce uh, antibiotics. So in the United States now, we rarely use vancomycin lock anymore. I use ethanol lock a lot. And this is more important for our pediatric ICU patient or patient that are on prolonged TPN. A lot of my patients go home on TPN and I write TPN for those patients. So they go on home. So that when you use ethanol, it's 70%. Again, study has shown that ethanol lock significantly reduces the rate of CLAP C compared to heparin lock. So remember, you have to lock it with heparin or else it's going to clot. Ethanol lock also decreased the need for line removal when used in conjunction with antimicrobial. And then ethanol lock was administered daily. So depending on the study, some study did it for daily, some study did it for twice a week, three times a week, up to 12, two hours. From a safety standpoint, they found that there are detrimental effect of ethanol lock on the catheter. So be careful when you use the ethanol lock, we found that when a patient use a pyrurethane catheter, like pick lines, that it's going to leak. So make sure that when you're gonna use it, you wanna use it only in silicon catheter. I don't know what kind of pick line catheter you have here, but we know we had to change our pick line catheter because it will leach through the line. We also found higher rates of thrombosis, catheter occlusion and line repair shown in a few studies. Keep in mind that ethanol and heparin are not compatible. They will precipitate. So a lot of time we have to make sure that ethanol is used to prevent infection, but you also want to prevent clot, right? The whole point of a central line is clot. So what we do is we, we separate the time, you flush the line with normal saline, you give heparin for about an hour or two, and then you also reflush the line before you start the ethanol. Uh, also, so my recommendation is, I think if you're gonna have a patient on prolonged line and concern for infection, that you may consider antibiotic lock therapy. One, for a neonatal ICU that has a high rate of central line infection. I'm not sure what the rate of central line infections in your hospital here, whether it's in the pediatric ICU or the neonatal ICU. The ethanol lock therapy should be reserved for more long-term, like our intestinal failure, these patients are on like months and years of parental nutrition. You need to consider reviewing your, obviously your institution antibiogram and the bacteria when determining what antibiotic you want to use to lock. You just wanna make sure that the antibiotic you use, um, you wanna give enough concentration. It will not be feasible for patients on continuous infusion, whether that be TPN, or like um, uh, adrenaline or fentanyl midazolam drip, you have to, you can't just stop those medications. You also have to be concerned for hypoglycemia. And if you're gonna implement using antibiotic lock, you have to have a process to make sure that you're not developing any sort of antimicrobial resistance. And then keep in mind that not all catheters are compatible as we found with the ethanol. So make sure you um, research on that as well. So factors to consider when you should use antibiotic lock therapy, make sure the antibiotic that you're using is at least 100 to 1,000 times your MIC of that organism. The minimum volume of that lock should be at least half a cc to one ml, or else it's not going to be enough to dwell and let it sit. The longer you let it sit, the better it is. But even if you lock it for 30 minutes, it's better than anything. And also the heparin concentration we use to lock is anywhere between 10 to 100 units per ml. How to initiate this therapy? You wanna stop the infusion and flush with normal saline first before you infuse the antibiotic lock. You lock it several times a day if you can. You dwell it for at least 20 to 30 minutes. Like I said, if you can prolong longer. So in the pediatric ICU, they might have multiple lumens. So maybe one day you'll lock one lumen, use the other, and then you alternate. This becomes a little bit more challenging in the pediatric ICU because most of our neonatal ICU would only have one pick line. You wanna make sure you withdraw the lock. The patient does not receive ethanol. You withdraw it at the end of the dwell time. And then you flush again with normal saline before you start your medication that the patient needs. You also wanna consider checking your blood glucose 
before and during, just because from those studies, they found some incidence of hypoglycemia. And do not give antibiotic lock therapy, obviously, if you're treating systemic antibiotic therapy. So in summary, you can see that there are conflicting data on prophylactic antibiotic. And I think you have to review the literature to see. I think that if your rates of central line infection is high, it may consider. But if your rate is very low, it's very difficult to find a significant reduction unless you have a lot of patients. I believe that the antimicrobial impregnated cancer catheter and the dressing did not show to have any beneficial effects in reduction of central line infection. And that central line bundle has shown to significantly reduce. And it doesn't work, matter what you have in that bundle, but make sure that you have compliance and you have daily assessment. You may consider anti-lock therapy in infants with high units of CLAP C, and that may be reserving ethanol for patients with long-term parental nutrition. At this time, I'd like to thank you and thank you. So 